Our guest is Jack Haley, and he is as familiar of personality as anyone, I would say. His voice familiar to radio listeners from uh, not so long ago, and his, his face in the disguise of a uh, uh, tin woodsman, and uh, without disguise is familiar to moviegoers from uh, not so long ago, too. Well, it's all according to what not so long ago means. <laughs> uh, I think it's a... Quite a, quite a lot of time ago. For example, uh, well, I think it was in 40, 45, I think I had my ra my radio show. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, in 1950, I had one of the first TV shows for Ford Motor Company. But time goes so fast, and as young as you look, it seems to be going uh, slowly <laughs> with you, not so long ago. When did you first... Uh begin your show business career? Oh, in vaudeville, way back mm. in vaudeville. It was more or less easy to uh, uh, to uh, enter this, the entertainment world in years ago through uh, vaudeville. There were many phases of vaudeville. There was the big time, there was the family time, and then there was the small time. And... Uh, if your talents were just meager, there seemed to be a place for you. But mm -hmm. today, they have no time for you. The young people have a more difficult job of uh, getting on that first ladder rung than uh, when I was a youngster. Mm -hmm. What did you do in vaudeville? Were you a singer well, first, and a dancer? Or well, first, I was mm -hmm. a, well, first, I was a song plugger, uh -huh. which is an unextant today. There was no medium to advertise a song. If you wrote a song and... And uh, if you did, someone didn't hear it, it was just a song that was written. And it had to be popularized. Well, how did they do it? Well, they sang wherever they could get a crowd. They sang at racetracks, dance halls, and primarily the motion picture theaters. And they had hmm. slides. And uh, if you were a song plugger, you, you stood in the doctor's side of the stage, or maybe in the orchestra pit, and then when the slides came on the screen, you sang the song. And that's, uh, they brought it back for a while. Remember with the bouncing ball? Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. that, that was what you did. That's the only way they could popularize the songs. Even in Boston, where I came from, they had piano on a truck on the street. And if someone played the piano, and the guy would sing the songs, and people would purchase them from the truck. Right on the spot. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you sell many songs that way? I didn't do that. I say in Boston. They oh, in Boston. Yeah. Well, you were born in Boston. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, that's how I started in the uh, business, and then I got a job in a girl act. Well, what's a girl act, Jack? A girl <laughs> act is a, <clears throat> it's a minimum, it's a, it's a small musical comedy in vaudeville. Well, this was a small time one. This was not on the big time. And it consists of a few chorus girls, principals, and a little plot, and uh, I got the job, and uh, that was the starting of my career, and I never stopped after that. Mm -hmm. Of course, I had ambitions to then to get a part and go out in what we call one in front of the odd, in front of the curtain, and entertain. And I did very successfully. I got a little other fellow, and he and I got an act together, and in six months it was unheard of. We were in the Palace Theater together, the famous Palace. And who was your partner? His name is Charlie Charlie Crafts, C R A F T S. I just buried him about a year ago. Oh, I mm -hmm. see. That was the beginning then. And the palace. Palace. Right well, the people didn't realize. People don't. When they hear about the palace, they don't realize its importance. See, there were around forty thousand vaudeville actors, or acts, mm -hmm. and about five hundred each year could get into the palace. And a great number were repeats. So we have all those people and the, with their eyes toward the palace theater. How can I get into that palace theater and get that wonderful trademark? That's what made it so popular. So when you trod that stage, you were something important because you were 500 out of 40,000. Mm -hmm. That's and the history of the palace. It really helped your career. You, with oh, that as your, oh, on your yes. credentials, you were ready oh, to go. Oh, huh? you're the Sinosia of all eyes. I mean, the producers see you. Ziegfeld went to the, to the palace. Mm -hmm. Dillingham, the Schuberts, everybody went to the Palace Theater. It probably was the, in its era, it was probably the, uh, the most discerning audience of all audiences. 
agents, actors, producers, and sundry people, you know, that are on the Broadway scene. Did you go directly from the palace then to the Broadway stage? Not directly, no. Mm -hmm. No, they, they look you over. You, have to, you, had, you had an apprenticeship, which you don't have today. Mm -hmm. one, record, one hit record, you know, which you sing, and uh, you've probably never been before an audience. But if you happen to be down in, in uh, where is it, in Virginia? Where is it they have the all the... Uh, Nashville? I Nashville, yeah. Tennessee. Yeah. If you're down in Nashville, Tennessee, and you happen to induce someone to make a record, and the record hits, you are a star right yeah. away. But in the old days, you had to uh, serve your apprenticeship. And they looked you over very thoroughly. They didn't go by one, one uh, audition, or not audition, but one uh, viewing. They looked you over thoroughly. And then I finally, I got in, finally got a Broadway show that made me a star, which was called Follow Through, in which I sang, Button Up Your Overcoat. Remember that song? You introduced yeah. it on the stage. That's true, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, from then on, it was, uh, you then are in the golden circle. And then mm -hmm. I was very <coughs> blessed. I had a very successful career. Was it easy from that point on then? No, I never as easy. So, yeah. Whether you're an author, there's the uh -huh. same way. Sits down at the typewriter and hopes it'll come out. When you do a play, you 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 hope it'll come out right. And sometimes they don't come out right. And it's always an interesting thing that the audience are the ones who decide whether it's good or not. All those with the expertise, they they falter. Mm -hmm. They don't know until the public says, "I don't like it. It's no good. What the hell did you put that together for?" <laughs> and they all think it's so great. Yeah. You were with uh, you worked with Ethel Merman and Olson and Johnson and uh I didn't I worked with Ethel Merman. <coughs> in fact, she uh, her first show she was had a small part on the show before she was in the show that I was starred in called Take a Chance and she and I together introduced for the first time you're an old smoothie I'm an old softy do you remember that oh, song Oh yeah, yeah sure and Didn't uh, you use that in uh, on the radio with uh, I did it with ja with with Gleason to, uh, to TV. Yeah, but I think you use that as a kind of a, a <coughs> theme song on the radio yes, show, too. Yes, that's true, mm -hmm. yeah. I had a, had a whole medley. But it was nice to be able to be associated with a hit song. Why? Well, yesterday <laughs> afternoon, yesterday afternoon at the Friars Club, they had their annual Dodgers send-off. The Dodgers go to camp Sunday. Uh-huh. And they all come to the club, and they give them a big luncheon, and O'Malley's were there, Walter and his son Peter, and the executives and all the ace players they could gather. And uh, they give them a salute, and while they were there, the guys, they had an orchestra there, while they were there, they played my song, you know. But when I was younger, it was nice to go into a cafe. As soon as you walk in, the guys in the orchestra play your music. They Immediately play, you know, recognizable, and yeah, boom, you'd walk in. New York, in. yeah. There are, there are wonderful uh, amenities connected with, with show business. People in the, in the, all over the world love entertainment so that they love those that give it to them. And uh, when you're a star, you're always assured of a front row down in, the, in, the, in some cafe or restaurant where mm -hmm. you go, special treatment. And uh, even as evil as Hitler was, he was nice to the entertainers. <laughs> he was. Yeah. Was he ever nice to you? I never knew him. Never no. <laughs> when did you first uh, hit the Hollywood for movie making? I was in the same show I told you to follow through, which was uh, in 1930. Mm -hmm. uh, that was sold to Paramount Pictures for a picture. And uh, I went along with the sale. They wanted me with the sale. So... Uh, I came out here and made that picture in 1930. That was the first picture I made. Then I went back into sh on the stage again, mm -hmm. and I came out after doing Take a Chance in 33, and I was back at Paramount again, and then I put my roots down here at that time, and I stayed here. Mm -hmm. I went back for show, come back and do pictures, but I've been here ever since. Didn't you appear in a lot of Vitaphone shorts? Yes. In fact, I have a picture I want to show you of my wife and I in a Vitaphone short. Uh, this was... Before the two-reeler, oh. I did some two-reelers first for Warner Brothers. But then uh, I have one of the first, my wife and I did one of the first Vitaphone uh, variety acts that uh, mm -hmm. was done. I have the picture here. How long have you been married? 
over 50 years. Over 50 years. Yeah. Now, well, Hollywood marriages, wife. they don't last, do they? <laughs> no, you don't hear of our kind of marriages. <laughs> you only hear the ones that the, uh, the divorce, you know. Uh, my son's new marriage, my son's first marriage with Liza Minnelli. I hope that we're an example for them. Because there's something in uh, that friendship. I told Liza, I said, you know, there's more to this marriage than romance. I said, it's a friendship. Imagine of all the billions of people in the world, you have this, you have this one friend who's your wife, or if it's a wife as a husband. One friend of all these people. It's awesome when you think of it. And this is a situation, but it's true because... It's a tough thing to be a real friend. You see it in this Watergate thing. You see, you see it in Connolly, former governor of Texas, with his dear friend Jacobson, closest buddy he had in the world, an attorney. Turns on him when it comes down to the when he wants. If he can escape jail, he'll be all right. Let Connolly go, his dear friend. <laughs> There's very little yeah. Damien, Damon and Pythias in the world. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to one friendship. And that's what a marriage is, that real friend that you have nobody else. It's your family. This, this is also your children. They, f go, they fly out of the nest, mm -hmm. which if you're understanding it, that's life. And they have their own families, and they go off, and uh, they have to worry about their own wives and their families and their husbands. And that leaves you two together, and that's the, the last trip down the road. That's where it's most delightful that you know that you have this real person. It's very warming. Sounds like a great piece of advice. I bet you're a pretty proud father, too, your son. Uh, I am, and I've been very, mm -hmm. very proud recently. My w wife is a rat, pa uh, rat pack. Hmm. Is that what you call it, a rat pack? She, she pack saves, rat. Sa pack <coughs> rat. Yeah. She saves uh -huh. and things, and she even saved a <coughs> packet of letters belonging to my son, and a couple of them were by me. And I was when I read it, I just had... He was a teenager, and uh, I just was proud that I've written this type of letter to him. So, uh, as the other three, you're talking about the material pride of a success. Now, well, yeah. that that's a different type of pride. That's a uh, that isn't that's a, that's not a real pride. That's not pride. You don't use pride there. Pride in something that you've given, not mm. pride in something that he has done. You're just happy that you have a good son. That's, that's most important. That is important. Sure. Yeah. We're proud of the things you've done, and you're not even related to us. You've done some pretty good things. What did you do? Um, your first film was the um, the follow through, mm -hmm. and then you were in. Uh, well, Joe, Jack Sitting Oakey pretty? and I did a uh -huh. yeah. Sitting <coughs> pretty. Jack Oakey mm -hmm. and I did a picture, and uh, called Sitting Pretty, and. Uh, it was a very successful picture for Paramount, and there was a song came out of that. I didn't sing it, but the song was, uh, "Did you ever see a dream walking?" Well, I did, and that song I was, I was very happy because I suggested these songwriters. They were neophytes, and the producer of the picture listened to me, and he sent for them and took a chance. And out of it, he got a smash hit, which is very unusual. You don't get them every time. You've been associated with some pretty big songs then. Yeah. Were, yeah. You, were you considered a musical comedy star? Or I was, sure. Uh -huh. I was always a musical comedy uh -huh. star. But I was, but I also could, uh, I had the facility to act too in, 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 in shows that weren't musical. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But uh, being a vaudevillian, you know, in vaudeville you had to either sing, dance, play an instrument, or recite. What's the reason for that, Jack? Well, because uh, you had to get off the stage. Mm -hmm. Today, at the end of... Aren't I garrulous? You didn't think I was as garrulous, did <laughs> All you? All right, go ahead. <laughs> when, uh, when you're on television, you do a monologue. Uh -huh. At a given point, you just bow. And they wipe out. The people are, they mm -hmm. ask the people to applaud, and they wipe out, and they, you go on. In vaudeville, you had to get off. As the expression was, it's easy to get on. But how do you get off? Yeah. And uh, you had to get applause. If you didn't get applause, no matter how good your act was, you had to get applause in order to sustain your bookings and get work. Mm -hmm. So they all devised different things. Instruments, dancing, singing. 
or recitation. Some they used to have wonderful comedy recitations that got applause, or sometimes dramatic, mm -hmm. and that got them off to applause. But in my case, it was uh, singing and dancing. I uh, studied tap dancing when I was a kid. Your big finish wasn't with the American flag and all of that uh, fireworks no. and the old uh, the cornball one that they always uh, have a lot of fun with, you know. Well, Fred Allen was one of the first uh -huh. to do that. When he, when his, at the end of his act, Abraham Lincoln's picture came down, <laughs> the, the American flag, all kinds of things came down from the flies, you know, for, to applaud. For you were in a picture that was all about radio, and it was a spoof of, uh, well, the, the so-called feud between Winchell and Bernie, you know, Wake Up and Live. Yes, Wake Up and Live. How do you remember? You're too, too young to remember well, Winchell and, and... Why? I grew up with Walter Winchell you and did? Ben Bernie, yeah. and, uh, you know, so the, the yeah. movies, uh, they're... They're, They're still, still around. around. Yeah, you get a chance still, yeah. to see them. And, uh, you were terrific in that picture. You were a Mike Frightened uh, singer, yes, yet you yes. didn't sing in that. No, uh, that was the fear. The two guys that I brought out here uh, did that the music. Mm -hmm. And there was a hit in that, too, uh, called, uh, called uh, Never in a Million Years Could There Be Another You. That was a big hit. Uh -huh. and Wake Up and Live was a hit. Uh -huh. And uh, Alice Faye and I, and... Uh, that was for Zanuck, 20th Century Fox. Mm -hmm. Now my son is vice president of TV. It's interesting, <laughs> you know, when you if you get older to to and have the mileage that I have, and then see things happen that you would never dream that would happen. Like for example, when I was making The Wizard of Oz with Judy Garland, and we're, when we're hopping down the yellow brick road, who would ever dream that she would have a child and my son would marry her? Yeah, yeah. This is. And the same way with, uh, as I just mentioned about the, the two writers, they wrote the, they they wanted their songs sung the best they could. I remember Zanuck saying, "Try and find a device. Haley sings. Get a device, some kind of a gimmick. That's all it has to be for this for people to be attracted to this man's voice on the air." And uh, they wanted, and they got very very good singer. Too bad his life was cut so short because he'd have been a great buddy, buddy, uh, buddy Clark, buddy Clark. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and what made the what made the uh, melding so great? He was from Boston. I'm from Boston, and there was detection with the with the uh, Bostonian mm -hmm. sound. Mm -hmm. So when I would speak, he sang Bostonian. I sang Boston, uh -huh. and my speech <laughs> was talking Bostonian. So they swore it was me. Yeah, it was very good. Fool Luella Parsons yeah. completely. Oh really? Oh yeah, she wrote. But I, I must have been taking lessons and everything. She was embarrassed about it. And then she called me down to Palm Springs to ask me if it was my voice. I told her no. Was Luella kind to you? Luella was a kind person. Yes. Mm -hmm. Her husband liked me, a doctor, Doctor Martin. She she was a uh, kind and she was strong. If uh, they ha they all have their likes and dislikes, mm -hmm. like everyone else. You were in a number of uh, films for 20th Century Fox, and then mm -hmm. you went to MGM for The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, mm -hmm. they they leased mm -hmm. me out. I was under contract to 20th. Mm -hmm. They leased me to Columbia too. I mm -hmm. several places I worked for them. Did they did did Metro ask for you? In that part where they looked, did they have you yes, in mind? Yes. Okay. No, no. Oh, no. <clears throat> Buddy Epson. Mm -hmm. He tried out. He tried for the part, and, and uh, I don't know what was lacking, but uh, they they decided that uh, that the uh, that they wanted me, and so uh, I I was they bought me or leased me rather from mm -hmm. from 20th Century, and I went over there. It was a horrendous job. Horrible. I think eight months all together. Those those outfits were so terrible. How long did it take you to get into that costume? Well, not to get in the, into the costume per se was nothing. It was the makeup. The makeup took mm -hmm. an hour and forty five minutes, and uh, you had to do that day in and day out. Oh yes, you? even taking it off was a chore. And I was on radio at the same time and staying up late with the writers trying to get a show together. And mm -hmm. Between the two, I could sleep all in between shots. And Bert Lau, who had difficulty, God rest his soul, in sleeping, he used to look at me, you know, sleeping on a reclining board. Mm -hmm. I couldn't sit down. I had a reclining board. He said, that Haley can sleep on a meat hook. <laughs> <laughs> we just came back. I was in New York last week. Mm -hmm. 
Ray Bolger, the straw man. We met Margaret Hamilton there. And the three of us were went to the Waldorf Astoria, and they had a tremendous toy exhibition of uh, the wizard characters. And they had buyers. They had about 800 people, and it was a dinner. And uh, we entertained. And What did you do? How did you entertain? Did you just I entertained. Well, Mervyn Leroy, the producer, was with us. Mm -hmm. And he was acted as the master of ceremony. He introduced me, and I went out and talked. And then uh, uh, at the end, I told him what I just told you about mm -hmm. the old-time vaudevillians, how they had to get off the stage. And I said, uh, recitation is a lost art. I said, I'm going to recite the type of thing that some of the vaudevillians use. Then I recited a, a thing I wrote called uh, Visit Him. No, the master's hand, that's the one I use. Well, we may and that gets me off with applause. <laughs> <laughs> we may ask you to get off that way, but not yet. I want to talk a little bit more about the Wizard of Oz, but they're going to run that on television uh, Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday mm -hmm. this year. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. You uh, say it took about eight months to put that thing together. Call, counting our rehearsals. Uh -huh. yeah. See, we had to rehearse, and uh, and uh, we had. It's it's very interesting about that picture. To realize that the man who directed that picture also directed Gone with the Wind, two of the great masterpieces in the in the motion picture world and that's uh, God of the Wind's never been on TV the uh, Wizard of Oz every year I think it gets over mm -hmm. gets a million dollars just for a shot on, on TV and uh, they never realized it would be that valuable when they made it yeah. they never thought it would go that way oh in fact it was a, it was a terrific gamble it cost uh, I think two and a half or three million dollars, which was a lot of money in those days, and today it would be it would be unrealistic to make it. They couldn't make it today, could they? They could, but it would cost them a fortune. First of all, where would they get 125 midgets? They're not around. They're not making midgets anymore. <laughs> <laughs> These the munchkins, they, huh? yeah, they came from all over the world. There used to be a vaudeville headline act called called. Uh, Oh, gosh, I, I can't think of his name. Singer. Singers, midgets. Mm -hmm. And it was, they had a band, they had dancers, they had singers, had a strong man. They had, a, they had a great headline act. And Mr. Singer knew that was his business, midgets. So when they made the picture, they came to him and asked him if he would get them the midgets. And mm -hmm. he, went up, he went around the world uh -huh. and got them. And then when they all got together, the different languages, they couldn't sing the songs. And the voices were so awful, and they devised a, a way to uh, have adults make the records. And then the midgets all mouthed it, and then they, take, they took the adults and uh, gimmicked them in some way. Mm -hmm. They probably speeded it up or it something a, like that uh, to get that higher yeah. pitch. Yes. Right? Did, you, did you work... Uh, a whole day on each each day you worked. Did you work a whole day, or did you work for two hours at a time, or was it in and out? No, we worked. We worked all day, <clears throat> and the union had just come into uh, to existence, Screen Actors Guild. So we only worked eight hours. Otherwise, they could in the old days they could work you beyond that. Mm -hmm. you know, to finish up a set to get off. And uh, the only respite we had was when Judy went to school because the state law in California the, the children have to go to school and they put a teacher on the set the studio pays for it that's a uh, California uh, school district teacher mm -hmm. and uh, when it's time for her to go to school everything stopped they tried sometimes to get shots without her but by and large, we would hang around for now. It was always a welcome sound when we hear this teacher's voice, Judy, <laughs> school. <laughs> did it always come at a regular time, or did the, was she a little flexible? Uh, no, she was very, she was very, uh, very adamant about it. She didn't care about the picture. She had her job mm -hmm, to do, mm -hmm. and uh, she, Judy, was certainly a sweet child, just a gorgeous kid. So exuberant, so so full of life, and her whole life was ahead of her, and, 
and she was star-eyed, you know, around the studio. This mm -hmm. I'd been, was, she was in the first picture with me too, Pigskin Pig Parade. Pigskin Parade. Yeah. Yeah, and so I could, I saw her, you know, I saw her, and I watched the three numbers she did and listened to her, and I knew that she was going to be something very important because of that voice. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's, you know, it's, a voice is one thing, then what are the other qualities with the mm -hmm. voice? Which I had this brought to my attention last week, a week ago Wednesday, in New York. I went to see The Wiz. And the, the Wiz is an all-black show spoof on The Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. And there's some moments in it that are very good. But they have a little girl playing Dorothy. And she's unattractive. And a little bow-legged. But she belts out a song, and that's why they hired her. But it's more, it's, there's more to it than that. Particularly if you want an audience to believe that uh, you have some big desire, mm -hmm. like going back to Kansas. Well, uh, the whole thing is more than any one element. It's everything put together, isn't it? I mean, a voice yes, and a personality. Yes, but I, can, I can see the yes, but I can see the producer hiring her because she can belt the song out. What she yeah. does is tremendous. The song, but that doesn't sustain the show. That's all right. To come on, do a couple of songs and off, uh -huh. you know, like Merman did in her first show, Girl Crazy. She sang one song, and it was a big hit. Uh, and uh, I can't remember the number at the moment. And she uh, w was a big hit. Well, that's all right in that spot. But she happened to have, when she went in the next show, she had the quality to carry on and hold the audience with her, mm -hmm. her performance. I want to ask uh, you to give us the benefit of your uh, being there kind of experience. You worked at 20th Century Fox and you were over at the MGM. Uh, what was the differences between the operations of the two studios, from your point of view as a, as a performer? Physically, there's no difference. You mm -hmm. drive in through a gate. You go to the commissary. The food in both places are good. Why? Because they, they want it good for their performers. They want it good for themselves. Mm -hmm. So they get the best they can in cuisine. Makeup people are all uh, tried and true. So all those facets of it were the same. The only difference is in the choice of the producers in the type of films they make. MGM had their style. 20th Century had their style. Warner had the guns and the gangsters, <laughs> and they had their style. That's the only difference. And uh, because they they're all have a, uh, a commercial aspect to all of them, there are, I don't think any producers or writers in those days mm -hmm. got up in the morning and said, let's do a fine artistic picture. Let's do a picture that will sell the people mm -hmm. and, and make some money. That's the uh, If it happens to be artistic, they're very happy about it. You talked about the, uh, the uh, fringe benefits, so to speak, of being uh, a star, a personality. You get a front table at a, at a show or in a restaurant or something like that. Uh, what kind of extra added benefits did you get uh, from the studios? Were they super nice to you? Did they? I mean, did you get a car at your disposal here and there? Or? No. What kind of glamour treatment did they give you, if if any? Well, I wasn't that. I wasn't that. Uh, to be very honest with you, I wasn't. Uh, that's that's. You're talking about superstar now. There's, there's a difference between a superstar and a star. And uh, a superstar is one that the people line up at the box office to see just their name. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter-in-law, Liza Minnelli, mm -hmm. she's a superstar. When she plays Las Vegas, the, the, they get money under the table to, to buy. They don't worry about who, about uh, if the people will come. They worry about who they're going to, you know, reject. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she goes over to England, and I, I mean to Europe, and. Uh, I think it was in, in Germany or Sweden or some place. She, she took $140,000 for her end. 10,000 people came to see her wow. in, a, uh, in, in, in a stadium type of place. That's a superstar. That, those are the people that get the type of uh, treatment that you speak of. Mm -hmm. They worry about them. You know, they, they want, because that's a terrific asset. That's as good as gold. They, mm -hmm. would t they take care of gold pretty good Well, they take care of uh, that superstar. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything they want, and are they happy? 
So that's a, that, that's the difference. I didn't have that. I just had, you know, I was a star, but I was never in that dimension. They must have lined up at the box office to see Jack Haley. Uh, I don't think they lined up at the box office to see me alone. I was always with pretty good stars, mm -hmm. you know, with me. And it was the, it was the package and the combination. In, um, in 1940, you were on the stage with Higher and Higher. Yes. And a few years later, you made the movie of that. Yes, that was Sinatra's first uh -huh. picture. Uh -huh. yeah. Boy, he was thin. Mm. Remember all the Sinatra oh, jokes sure. about his thinness? Yeah. My God, he was thin. I saw the picture on the Late Show not too long ago, and he was terribly thin. <laughs> they used to joke about him standing behind the microphone, and all you'd see was his bow tie. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was he pretty scared making that first picture? No, no, he had good control of himself from. Uh, singing in the band, and uh, and he had by this time he'd been out on his own, uh, walking out on a nightclub floor, mm -hmm. and uh, and playing uh, the motion picture theaters as a, an, a vaudeville attraction, and with that kind of uh, you become uh, really hardened, mm -hmm. you know you don't your fear is all gone, you 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 have no trepidation, and so to what it was his first acting part, but. Acting is just being natural, more or less. Acting is more difficult on the stage than it is. You have to project on the stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the studio, you just be yourself. It's like, to me, always was a rehearsal. I never could quite get used to it. No audience. And, uh, and some people are, are excellent you know, rehearsers. They rehearse beautifully. Mm -hmm. When the curtain goes up, something's gone. They, they, they don't project. Well, those rehearsals are great on the, on the screen. Gary Cooper was one. Uh -huh. You couldn't hear him past the second row, but on the screen he was yeah. just some mag magic. I don't know what it is. You said that when you were making The Wizard of Oz, you were uh, uh, putting together a radio program. I'd like to talk about the radio things a little bit. What were you doing? What show was it at that time? I was doing, uh, I believe it was, uh, I believe it was uh, Wonder Bread. For national, for the uh, for the bakery, of, of, uh, I forget the, the the name of the company. Continental. Standard brand, no Continental, Continental bakery, bakery. Yeah, uh -huh. I was doing that at that time. I'd done. I'd worked for uh, National Dairy. I had a show for them a couple of years. And uh, was that Seal Test? Yes, Seal uh -huh. Test. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, we had quite a. I had quite uh, good ratings, you know, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it's a uh, it's a mystery about your careers. You know, people have low have valleys and they have peaks in their careers. And uh, I didn't like that when I when I got started to get a little older. Mm -hmm. And that's why I became interested in business instead of sitting home waiting for an agent. I became curious and then I went into a, a subdivision and I had better success than I've ever had in, in I'm speaking financially though mm -hmm. than I had in uh, in show business. Uh, are your real estate interests out in uh, California here? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Say close to you. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would you say the radio days were a, a valley in your career? No, but I'm saying that uh, no matter what what your you know what your position mm -hmm. is, I mean what your what part of entertainment you follow, there's always. I mean, look at Mar Marie Dressler. She was one of the great stars at, at MGM mm -hmm. and. She got so low that she had to borrow money from her maid that lived with her, hmm. cook, maid and a cook, and she had to borrow money from her because of the valley that she was in. That's that's the type of, uh, and and it's a uh, it's rather ignoble to sit home and wait for somebody to call you hmm. to hire you. You know, that is you you don't feel like you're part of it. You know if you. If you manufacture something, then uh, you manufacture the product, keep busy at it, and try to sell it. But in show business, you have to sit home and wait until the agent sells you or the, someone wants mm -hmm. you. And then, uh, yeah, and then if you're around a while, it says, yes, well, he's been around and so forth. I don't know what the, what the dialogue is, but I know that it's tough for a lot of people mm -hmm. in show business. You've done so many things in so many different areas of uh, show business, which... Not, not considering a financial success or a popular success. Which of the things that you've done were you happiest with? Well, 
And there are two versions. One is the <laughs> easiest job in the uh -huh. world was radio. Mm -hmm. You took a piece of paper and read it for uh, a half hour, which wasn't a totally a half hour because there were commercials in mm. between. That was the easiest. It was like stealing money. <laughs> that's number one. That's one. The theater is the most fulfilling job. When you walk out on the stage and hear those people laugh, and and that you're privileged to do that, that the uh, you know that God gave you the talent to do that, it, it's it's a wonderful feeling, and uh, it's it's joyous, you know, particularly if you're in a great show like I've been in great shows where the people scream because of the situations and the and the uh, the jokes and the lines and so forth, and it's a pleasure to. Leave your apartment and get in your cab, get in a cab and drive down to the theater and make, get made up and go out there and know you're going to make a lot of people happy for two hour, two and a half hours every night and twice on matinee days. Those two. Now the picture to me is just drudgery. Mm -hmm. You have to study your lines at night and go on the set and know them. And now, all right, let's try it again, you know. You do it over again. Something happens. Something's wrong with the film. So something's wrong with the sound. Let's try it again, you know, and you do it. The, they, I've heard them say, we'll have a lot of fun in this picture. I fail to see any fun at all. To me, it's just work. There's no joy in it. The only fun you have is when you're in between shots, when you're cutting up and talking about old, old days or, mm -hmm. or telling experiences in show business, which actors are prone to do. But as far as work is concerned, I see no enjoyment. In and then when you see the, the, the finish, you know you could have done it better. <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. So uh, there's no real joy in, in that. I, in the theater, they're out there to tell you. I write this in my autobiography, you know. I even tell about, uh, about going up to get that Oscar. It's something you did seven, eight months ago. But you mm -hmm. are not sure whether you could remember everything that you did. Now you're receiving an Oscar for this. Where in the theater, at opening night, that's the real Oscar. And everybody shares in it. The audience, are, they give, give you the Oscar by their applause and their acclamation. And they, they swarm backstage at the end of the show. And you can tell the difference between genuine appreciation and a hit than you can if you're fair weather friends. Oh, that was fine. It was a great mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. There's a difference because you, you're smart enough to know the audience tell you. You were just uh, elected president of the Friars Club. Yes, I first, yeah, Buddy Hackett was to, I superseded me. Uh -huh. What exactly is the Friars Club? The Friars Club is a social club that has a uh, uh, Overtones of charity. They've given mm -hmm. over five million dollars to various charities mm -hmm. since their inauguration out here, and uh, it's uh, social. You know, it has it has a gymnasium, card room, has wonderful food, and it has great shows that they put on entertainment, much like the Bohemian Club up mm -hmm. in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were at the um playing cards at a Friars Club, at the Friars Club sometime, and you were just kind of kicking it around with some of your cronies, reminiscing about your the old days, so to speak. What first favorite story do you have about the old days? I haven't any favorite. When you talk about, you know, nostalgia, one, one uh, story or one thought starts a new one. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can't remember any particular uh, story about uh, about. Uh, I have a very long one that I, could, I have in my autobiography about uh, about uh, falsifying the claim that the audience you can't fool an audience and. Uh, in substance, that's pretty true. An audience are very, very smart collectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have a sense that something's wrong, uh, that something's wrong with a person on the stage, or someone has missed their cue. But uh, 
this was a complete reversal of that and they and an, and an actor, and I don't want to go into the detail. I shouldn't even mention it. I didn't cut it out <laughs> anyway. But this fellow, this man, a juggler was drunk on the stage, uh -huh. it's, it's, and uh, he did a cannonball at the end of a thing he had on his head, you know. And the or orchestra were afraid that it was going to hit them on the head, and he mm -hmm. was drunk, hangover he had. And the uh, famous old-time old actor was making a personal appearance. His name was Robert Warwick, and at the end of his sketch, he always made a speech, and he told the audience. They knew this man was something wrong with this man. He was dropping the plates and this, <laughs> everything, uh -huh, uh -huh. and he told them that he was a war veteran. He said he's he's a, he's, a, he's a an Australian, and he fought under the same flag as you Canadians. Was up in Canada, and before they he finished, they were cheering for this guy with a hangover. <laughs> I grabbed him and got him. I said, "I said they want you." He thought they thought the police wanted him. <laughs> yeah. I told him, and he came out on the stage, and they just cheered him, you know. And all he said was, "He says he's a pal. He's a pal." That's all he could say. <laughs> so really you, fooled an audience. Fooled the audience. Yeah, yeah, the audience thought that guy was suffering uh -huh. a, um, a uh, what a, a shell shock. No, uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. shell shock. It was bottle shock. <laughs> <laughs> Audience have enjoyed you for so many years. What have you been doing since the last film, aside from the real estate things? Just kind of taking it easy. Well, I not like I went to New York for that mm -hmm. trip, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, and went there because I was going to be in congenial company, and also that uh, gives you a chance to see a show or or uh, see your friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did. I I. I I entertain. I'm a Catholic, and I'll entertain at uh, Catholic breakfast, communion breakfast, they call them, or or dinner that they mm -hmm. that they may have. And I have a whole lot of you know Catholic jokes, and uh, I also can function as master of ceremonies. That's all I do in the theatrical end. Uh, Jackie Gleason is going back on TV. He'll probably want me to do something. We're very close friends, mm -hmm. and uh, but as far as uh, as far as uh, why well, did they well be because mm -hmm. uh, because uh, he, Robert Young, who's a friend of mine, Doctor Welby, uh, called me up and asked me to do it. He said, "There's a part. Gee, I wish you'd do it for me." So I did it, and it turned out very very well, and uh, but. I'm occupied all the time. Mm -hmm. I have. I don't have time to sit around like you just said. So when you're over there in the club and you're talking, I have no time for that. <laughs> I just. I, I, I'll go to my office and there are letters to write. There's always something to do, and uh, or to read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never find myself saying, yes, "Honey, let's call up uh, Tom and Mary and see what they're doing." Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of people have to do. I don't need that. I, I'm occupied completely. And that's one of the schemes of life. I mean, I think that's a, a very important part of life, to be occupied instead of uh, uh, moping around the mm -hmm. house. You really got a great philosophy of life. You're great. I have a religious philosophy mm -hmm. that I haven't got time to go into now. <laughs> We've just got time for the Jack Haley super finish. Well, as well, I... You Get the tin suit. <laughs> I said at one of the dinners, they had a dinner for uh -huh. for, for Eliza at the Maskers Club. And uh, I said, they wanted me to wear my tin suit here tonight, but I refused. I said, the last time I wore it, I said, I crossed my legs and al almost became Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a finish. Thank you, Jack Haley. Okay.